really dynamic poems by three wonderful authors, two of whom I'm happy to say, you know, I, I often come to these um, these discussions, I, I, I don't really like to call them lectures. I, I like to call them more like a discussion forum because I like to think of it less as a class and more as an, you know, an opportunity to share what we think as I, as I do what I do, you know, walk us through the poetry and things together. But almost everybody we've talked about over the years is gone you know they're 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 dead poets uh like dead poet society but i'm happy to say that two of the three today are still with us and that's the really marvelous i, I back in the day when he came to seton hall years ago we used to call him a rising star on the poetry horizon his name's major jackson what a great name right um, Major Jackson is now in his early 50s, and uh, I remember when in his late 30s, he was really making a name for himself on the poetry scene, and then somebody a little bit older than that, we won't say how much, Rita Dove uh, is really, oh, I'm sorry, we're actually doing Lucille Clifton today, excuse me, Rita Dove will be another time. We did Rita Dove last week with American Smooth, so as some of you know, some of you are on my daily poetry thread, and uh, I've got poetry like running in and out of my head like Grand Central without COVID. Um, so, um, you know, so, so there's a lot going on. So always interrupt me and correct me if I'm getting far afield here. Anyway, how about we start with the freedom train and um, we can walk our way through it. And then between these two poems, between freedom train and on disappearing by Major Jackson, what I would like to do is I have a recommendation for those of you who have laptops or you're good with the phones or you know people who, do, who are, or you have children or grandchildren who are, there are some really awesome links of not just these poems being read, but in some cases, like with Langston Hughes, the poems being read by celebrities, celebrities from his time and current times, like Morgan Freeman, and in other cases, Major Jackson and Lucio Clifton reading their poems at, at, at events. So it's really kind of cool to be able to tap into that. But I'll get to that in a minute. Let's get on the freedom train. So Michael, would you be able to put that up on a shared screen for us? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so uh, as we typically do, um, I'll start off with those first four first four lines you know what I think of as the first this is the longest poem I think we have today which is fine we'll start there and they'll get they'll get smaller so we'll have plenty of time to cover them all um, I absolutely love this poem the first thing I want to call your attention to is the year it was published 1947 and at this point imagine this is this is literally two years after the end of World War II as I'm sure all of you figured out right um, I don't do math well, but I, I do enough math to know that. And there are references in this poem to where Hughes's brother died fighting in what we think of, we always think about the Normandy invasion and D-Day on June 6th. And, and, and obviously that's where most of, 90% of the focus was. But some of you remember or heard or read, or even you may have experienced from your own family and experience, there was a second uh, invasion of the continent from the south that went through Italy, which had already been, you know, prior, you know, in some ways liberated by Patton and the Third Army and, and Allied forces. But that reference point to a particular uh, city is in Italy where, where Langston Hughes' brother perished. So he's kind of connecting, you know, like now that, now that we have fought side by side, in liberating the world from tyranny and from 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 the Third Reich, um, now let's get on that freedom train together in this country. So I'll start off at the beginning, and then as I typically do, I'm going to ask if somebody would pick up the next stanza, working starting with Washington. But let me start with this, and you can and and I'll, well, I'll read and then I'll talk. I read in the papers about the freedom train. I heard on the radio about the freedom train. I've seen folks talking about the freedom train. Lord, I've been waiting for the freedom train. You notice right off the bat, we have a kind of repetition. Typically in poetry, when you start a line, Whitman's very famous for this, but other poets do it as well. When you start a line with the same word or even the same 
two or three word phrase. The Greeks used to call that, we use it today rhetorically, called anaphora. A-N-A-P-H-O-R-A. Some of you are familiar with that term. So Whitman will say like, oh this, oh that, oh. And it's a rhetorical repetition. Notice what Hughes is doing at the end here. He's creating a kind of, there's actually another word that I, I, you have, have to look up. When you end the line the same way, it is the other side of anaphora. And I know the Greeks have a different word for that altogether, but I just noticed like all those first three lines, all the lines end with freedom train, but those first three lines end with about the freedom train, about the freedom train, about the freedom train. So what do we notice about this poem right off the bat? The poem is meant to be read aloud. The poem is not just for something to hear in your head. The poem is something that <clears throat> it has with all of Langston used, um, he is tapping in to this really virtually brand new type of music that we think of today famously as jazz, which was invented in the United States, in the South, in New Orleans. Some of you have seen um, <clears throat> La La Land, all right? So are, are your jazz fans. So you can, you can hear there's a musical dimension to all of this. And it starts off rather simply, almost like a refrain. And you could, you could hear the rhythm. I read in the, about the freedom train, the freedom train, the freedom train. So I'm going to ask someone to pick up from there and take us from Washington and the locations. Now he's going to specify. And you notice, too, I'll say this up front. It's almost like right after that opening quatrain, those first four lines, he's getting into where the freedom train stops. So if somebody can read from Washington to the and where it ends with just a, that phrase, freedom train, I'd be happy to volunteer. Clara, I'll you, read. Oh, great, awesome. Washington, Richmond, Durham, Chattanooga, Atlanta, way across Georgia. Lord, 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 way down in Dixie, the only trains I see got a Jim Crow coaches set aside for me. I hope there ain't no Jim Crow on the freedom train, no back door entrance to the freedom train, no sign for colored on the freedom train, no white folks only on the freedom train. I'm going to check up. I'm going to check up on this freedom train. Wow, thank you. And uh, who, who, could you just tell me who, who read that? Clara. Clara, you read that beautifully. That was awesome. I had like a tear in my eye when you read it. And this is a poem I've seen once or twice. So, Mike, if you just go up a little bit to, yeah, right I like there, right Langston there, right there. Oh, like, and, yeah. and when, you know, it's so amazing, and you could say this about so many poets, but some poets just lend themselves to being read aloud, and man, I tell you, if you are, if you're going a little kind of like, you know, you're getting, you're getting, you're getting some summertime cabin fever, by the way, um, folks, hey, you know what's also going on today in addition to Juneteenth? It is wow. the last full day of spring. So tomorrow, we are on that freedom train into summertime. But even in summertime, if you're feeling a little cabin fever with your summertime, you know what? I have a perfect remedy for that. Every day, every day, find the poem you love, like this poem or another poem. Or find, it doesn't have to take all day. Just find the poem you love and read it to somebody in your house, somebody you live with. <clears throat> One of your kids, your spouse, anybody, you will feel a sense of joy and, and a sense of enlightenment. You, you, like your spirit will lighten reading to each other at this time. Because I can tell you, back in the day, in the 19th century, in Europe, in England, in the United States, what people did at night after dinner around the fireplace and with no incandescent lighting is they didn't have television to watch. They didn't have radio to listen to. You know what they did? They read poetry yeah. to each other. They wow. read from Charles Dickens to each other. They read Shakespeare aloud. And they oh, really? couldn't wait to do it. And they didn't want to go outside to a party. I mean, sure, that's great. We're used to that. We want to go back to the movies. But in the meantime, we can learn something from those Victorians. So thank you, Clara. That was beautiful. You can hear the rhythm. You can hear it. Mm -hmm. And every time I come across that phrase, Chattanooga, I always thank God for Chattanooga Choo Choo. Right. Because without <laughs> that song, I'm not sure I would be able to pronounce that word. 
I would have said, uh, Ch Chattanooga, uh, <laughs> Chattanooga <laughs> Choo Choo, you know? Chattanooga um, Choo Choo. And you notice that he's writing, what, what he's talking about on this train, although for us, obviously, even in light of today's circumstances, feels very old. For him, for Langston Hughes writing at this time is very real. This is his life. He's from North Carolina. He studied at Columbia. He lived and worked in the Northeast. He traveled. He was on many a train. And he's used to seeing those signs, colored, white folks only. So you notice here as he works us through this stanza, he says, you know, he's talking about what he's hoping. It's all about aspiration. It's not about, I don't know about this freedom train. I heard about it. I heard first folks talking about it, but I want to, at the end, I love that. I'm going to check up. Almost it's like you're inside his head thinking it, right? I'm going to yeah. check up. I'm going to check up on this freedom train. Like I got to do some research. I heard there might be a train where everybody's the same and everybody's welcome, but I'm checking up on it. So let's go to stanza three. Who's going to read that for us? Who is the engineer? I love this part. Who is the engineer on the freedom train? Who wants to, who's driving this train? May I? Shirley Gordon. Shirley, please help. Yes, uh, by all means. Thank you. Who is the engineer on the freedom train? Can a coal black man drive the freedom train? Or am I still a porter on the freedom train? Is there ballot boxes on the freedom train? Colored folks vote on the freedom train. When it stops in Mississippi, will it be made plain? Everybody's got a right to board the freedom train. I'm going to check up. I'm going to check up on this freedom train. Shirley, mm -hmm. magnificent. Man, you put, all of you put your reading caps on today. Let me tell you, this is great. <laughs> This well, is I great. love him. I, I don't know. Him. Yeah, go I ahead. Have the Dream Keeper is one of my favorite books. Oh, of his. yeah. It's so yeah. beautiful. Short it's so poems. beautiful. Yeah. Great. And you see, like, here it is. It's 2020. This is written in 1947. And it is so relevant. And again, he keeps ending with a series of questions. You know, who's the engineer? Can the coal black man? And also remember, the, you know, less so in, in uses time, but once upon a time, the coal black man is actually not just referring to the color of one's skin, but we remember the days when the trains were run right. by coal. Right. Oh, literally, you had to shovel that right. coal into the engine to make it work. Yeah. So there's all of that going on here. And then he gets right to the heart of the issue, the ballot box, right? Can I vote on the freedom train? And he doesn't distinguish man or women, it, woman. It says, you know, I want everybody to do colored folks vote on the freedom train when it stops. And then he goes right into one. Notice we had a lot of specific geographical cities, locations, states before. Now it's very specific when it stops in Mississippi because he knows, he knows very well, and that's going to be a little bit different than being up in Harlem, let's say, you know? So he's going to keep checking on the Freedom Train. Let's continue on. This is great. We're, we're on the train, and you could feel it chugging. So who's, who will go next? Hi. Can we hear you? Nobody's reading. Hello? Anybody want to volunteer? I'll, I'll do it. And who are you? Myra. Myra, sure. Thank you, Myra. I can't really see everybody. I see me and I see phones. So by all means, just please announce who you are so we can say hi. <clears throat> Thank you, Myra. Okay. The Birmingham stations marked colored and white. The white folks go left, the colored go right. They even got a segregated lane. Is that the way to get aboard the freedom train? I'm gonna check up. I'm gonna check up on this freedom train. So again, thank you, Myra. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot going on here. You know, he's talking about specifically that went from Mississippi to Birmingham, Alabama. And it's it, interestingly enough, it's not gonna be too long from now. It's gonna be just about less than 20 years where somebody we famously know today as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is going to write one of the most famous texts he ever produced 
from a jail in Birmingham that's forever known as Letter from a Birmingham Jail. So you could see these connections in history and time and space. Yous obviously couldn't possibly know that, but it's interesting to see how, you know, as, as, as Shakespeare famously said in The Tempest, what is past is prologue. Right, uh, that's where it comes from. Act five. Um, I now who can tell? I have a question before we go further. Why is it the when you think about how you get on a train? He talks about the white folks going left and the colored folks going right. What does that suggest in how you would get on a train? Now I know it also depends on what side of the tracks you're on. Right, one side of the tracks it could be one thing or another. But I have something specific in mind that you may be thinking of. The front and the back. Yes, exactly. That's what he's thinking about. Because yeah. the, 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 the white folks go to the front and the, all of the other folks go to the back. That's where you get the expression, back of the train, back right. of the bus, back mm -hmm. of everything. It's like the, if you, some of you remember the film Gandhi that starts off famously where he's thrown out of the first class seat while he's going to South Africa. Even though he's an attorney from London, he's considered colored. You know, and that's where that's what happens. So the use is still wondering. I'm gonna check up. I'm gonna check up. Now goes a little bit further. And now he's gonna reference his brother Jimmy at Anzio. So with um Myra, would you continue reading? We'll just we have a lot to read today, so I'm gonna call on people more than once. Sure. If my children ask me, Daddy, please explain why a Jim Crow stations for the freedom train, what shall I tell my children? You tell me, cause freedom ain't freedom when a man ain't free. My brother named Jimmy died at Anzio. He died for real and it wasn't no show. This is a very powerful line. You know, notice here, he's not checking up on the freedom train. He's already anticipating in the future. You know, one of the things that all of our visionary poets have is a sense of not just time and place, and not just past, but they imagine writing for an audience that maybe doesn't even exist yet. That doesn't even, you know, Langston Hughes could not know that one day in 2020, in the middle of so much else going on, we'd be reading this poem aloud. So he's doing it for the next generation. If my children ask me, Daddy, please explain why a Jim Crow stations for the freedom train, what shall I tell my children? And then that amazing line where he oh, oh, you know, rep, triplicates the use of free, because freedom ain't freedom when a man ain't free. It's so simple, but it just resonates as so true. And then he reminds everybody, in case you didn't know, my real brother, my brother Jimmy, died overseas. And he adds, he died for real. It wasn't no show. Like this is no laughing matter anymore. Like we, we people of color are dying for this ideal. We're dying for the same flag and for the same rights that everyone else died for. So we need to be treated the same. So <clears throat> who will pick up from there? Will we have a new reader or someone who's read before? Let's go to the next long stanza here. Any volunteers? I'll do it again with Clara. Do you want me to start again? Please do it. You are, just remind me. Shirley. Shirley, thank you, Shirley. Again, okay. I can't see any faces. I know, it's, I can see yours. <laughs> <laughs> Is this here freedom on the freedom train really freedom or a show again? Now, let the freedom train come zooming down the track, gleaming in the sunlight for white and black. Not stopping at no stations market, marked colored nor white, not stopping in the fields in the broad daylight, stopping in the country in the wide open air where there never was a Jim Crow sign nowhere, and no lily white committees, politicians of note, nor old tax layer through which colored can't vote, and there won't be no kind of color lines. The freedom train will be yours and mine. 
Okay, awesome, awesome. Thank you, Shirley. Yes. Um, in fact, I'm going to probably forget to do this later, but I got, um, when I did a, a concert with about 250 other singers, it wasn't just me, uh, we got these cool shirts. This was a Christmas concert. I'm going to kind of show you all. <coughs> it's called the Christmas Holiday Spectacular with John Levitt. John Levitt is a truly great composer, arranger, conductor, but I specifically wore it because of that silhouette of the Statue of Liberty. Um, because this, for me, this poem is all about that. It's all about what is liberty for real. Oh, I can see Myra now. So um, we'll put the poem back up. Yes, thank you, Michael. So here, he gets into even more. Now, again, it's kind of, I know it's a complete coincidence, but did Langston Hughes know that with the Freedom Train zooming down the track, that we would be talking about it while we're zooming? No. <laughs> that, is a, that is a bad joke, I'm sorry. Isn't it, isn't it interesting? I always tell my students, I say, when I was a kid, a web met one thing and one thing only. It meant something a spider made. And now the web means, you know, that is like the secondary definition, right. the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary. The web today means the internet. So it's interesting how words go. But the other thing I want to point out about this poem, it is a good place to do it, is that this is a poem about a journey. This is a poem about movement. This is not a poem about contemplation. It's not a poem about sitting in place and thinking about these things. The whole idea of the freedom train is zooming down the track. And Hughes wants us to feel that. He wants us to feel that trains, well, you know, they kind of, trains have that, just like airplanes on, the, you know, when they're take, given clearance for takeoff. They, they go from a dead stop, they go from a dead stop, and then they pick up speed, and once they pick up speed, they are really rolling. You know, they have to get to a certain miles per hour to assume flight. And we know once a train starts chugging very slowly down the track, it hits these incredible speeds. So blues is constantly undergirding this. The freedom train, yes, it is one grand metaphor that unifies this poem, but it's also something to remind us of the rhythm, the musical dimension of this. And then he gets again, just like he talks about the vote, just like he talks about ballots, you know, no lily white committees, politicians of note, nor poll tax layer through which colored can't vote. Interesting that in 1947, Hughes is thinking about things we're still thinking about, like who gets to vote, who doesn't get to vote, mail-in ballots versus no mail-in ballots. You know, some of these battles, these battles are far from over. And then, Michael, if you raise the screen a little bit further, thank you. If we get to the, we get to the bottom here, right? Is there, just let me see if there's any more of the poem after this. Oh, okay, okay, we have the answer. So we're, we've come to the very end. So would somebody like to just take us home and then we'll put it all together? Clara. Clara, you're up, Clara. Okay. Then maybe from their graves in Anzio, black men and white will say, we want it so. Black men and white will say, ain't it fine. At home, they got a freedom train, a freedom train that's yours and mine. Wow, this is, I love how he lands this. It's almost as though the freedom train keeps going and notice, Notice we have a, a major shift in the tone here. Up till mm -hmm. now, you know, use if you want to divide the poem up, and it's a, if you know, it's a fairly, you know, it's a substantial poem. It's not a, not a short poem. It's not like Emily Dickinson. But he starts off wondering about the freedom train. I heard about the freedom train. I'm going to look into this freedom train. And then he gets into questions. Do they have this? Do they have that? Is it white only? Is it colored only? What about the voting? What about this? He brings in all of these different layers, all the while reminding us about the freedom train is moving. And then he's already introduced his brother, Jimmy, having died and buried in the battlefield in Anzio. <laughs> And this is where he lands the poem. And I love the way he does it. I just love the way he asks this question. Maybe that it's a question and an aspiration all at the same time. Because maybe we'll come today. Maybe then, right? That's to say, let's suppose, maybe then, sometime, maybe not in 1947, maybe not even in 2020, but maybe then from their graves, 
in Anzio, black men and white will say, we want it so. So the aspiration is not that this is just what people of color want, but that white folk will join us and want it for us too, because here we are together, you know, occupying the same earth in Anzio, having died on the same team, fighting for the same cause. Black men and white will say, ain't it fine? John, At home, they got a freedom train, a freedom train that cheers the mind. Yes. But surely again, may I just tell you something? Yes, please. At, um, at at um, the Battle of the Bulge, which is Anzio, my uncle, uh, who was, of course, white and a dentist, was in a company of all black men. That's wow. the way it was in those days. I mean, it had that army had not been uh, black and white together. And, yes. and, and so he, from the North, for the first time, uh, suffered. I mean, he went to sit in the back of the bus with his guys, and the bus driver wouldn't drive the bus, and he wouldn't move. <laughs> yeah, so, no, absolutely. You know, I mean, Ab yeah. uh, so when you read this last one, it has, to me, so much more meaning, knowing I agree. that this man died in an all-black company. He yes. was not with his white uh, compatriots. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. Just like just there's, um, I'll, I'll reference another poem at the end. Thank you for sharing that because that is a, such an important. It's so amazing to be able to have these historical and personal touchstones to what's going on in the poem. And you're right. Back in those days, we were dealing with a segregated army. Yeah. And does anybody recall? Here's a here's a little history quiz. Who, by executive order, not through an act of Congress, desegregated the United States Army, even though his advisors told him it will probably cost him his reelection? Right. Truman. Yes. Truman. Harry Truman. Harry Truman. And he said, I don't care about the reelection. If care. I lose, I lose. This is the right thing to do. And he knew, he knew if he went through the channels, and didn't do it by executive order. It, it, and think about when Truman was president. That is before the Civil War. You know, that's in the 1950s. That's before it became a popular thing to do. And Truman, being from the Midwest, being from Independence, Missouri, as he would say, knew how unpopular this would be, not just in the military, but in the white citizenship, you know? So, but but Truman, again, one of the reasons we call Truman, and they know he wasn't a perfect president, we hold him in such esteem, is we all remember the sign he had on his White House desk. The book stops here. The book <laughs> stops here, pal. That's it. I take the hits, nobody else. So God bless him. I mean, Harry Truman has always been a hero of mine. So um, thank you for that. Thank you for that personal connection to this poem and yes even though the the, the poet the, the fight the soldiers were not buried together they're buried in you know they're, they're buried in the same place they're buried where the battle of the bulge occurred in the liberation of europe so yeah. it's an interest so thank you all let's go to something else now this is by one of our great living american poets major jackson and I will, again, recommend that if you have the technology with the Freedom Train and with this poem and with the poem we're going to end up with today, you can find all of these. If you do a Google YouTube search, you could Google the title of the poem and the author, go to video, and you could take your pick of so many of these being read aloud. This one is a phenomenal reading. I think it's in... Oh God, I can't remember where he was reading it now. It's like Princeton or Yale or something like that. Major Jackson is reading this aloud. So I will start the first stanza um, and we can, we can go ahead from there. And you notice here, this is a different sort of poem. This is not about a freedom train. This is really about existence. This is about who I am. And yet it kind of, in one sense, Major Jackson being a black poet, it's about race, but at the same time, it's about everybody. It's about our place in the world and what we're here to do. So I'll start off on Disappearing by Major Jackson. I have not disappeared. 
The boulevard is full of my steps. The sky is full of my thinking. An archbishop prays for my soul, even though we met only once. And even then, he was busy waving at a congregation. So I know there's a split here, but I'm going to stop there. Could somebody pick up with the ticking clocks, please? Anybody at all? <laughs> I love want? to read, but I, I don't want to be the only reader. Oh, that's, well, you know what? If we I'm have no volunteers. The ticking clocks in Vermont's way. Yes back and forth as though sweeping up my eyes and my tattoos and my metaphors. And when comes up are, and what comes up are the great paragraphs of dust, which also carry motes of my existence. I have not disappeared. My wife quivers inside a kiss. My pulse was given to her many times in many countries okay pause there for a second we're going to do this in, in sections thank you so much yeah and you know this is this is again i never think of think of this as a class but this is similar to a class in you know what happens in a class of five students or a class yeah. of 50 students i yes. always have the same readers right <laughs> i always have the same six kids raising their hands with three kids i'll read i'll read it and then somebody in the back's like no don't call on me don't call on me <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. I'm happy to. I'm happy to have the help. So you notice how he connects all of this with place and time. There's a lot of there's space. What I call spatial and temporal references in here about space and time. Because when we exist, when we are in, when we are occupying space and time, we are visible. We are appearing. We're not on dis about disappearing. So he talks about the kick clicking ticking clocks in Vermont. And I love this, I love this phrase, back and forth as though sweeping up my eyes on my tattoos and my metaphors. And he refer kind of references himself in here as a poet. And I imagine, though I've never seen them, he probably has a couple tattoos, right? And what <laughs> comes up are the great paragraphs of dust. I love that, the great paragraphs of dust, which also carry motes of my existence. So I exist, also, and this is so true of every artist, I exist in what I create. I exist in the poetry I've written. Mozart and, 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 and um, you know, Stevie Wonder and Paul McCartney, whose birthday was yesterday, turned 78. Uh, they all exist in their music. And we, they, they don't disappear because of their music even after they have physically gone. I have not disappeared. My wife quivers inside a kiss. So continue reading from there a little further. The chunks of bread we dip in olive oil is communion with our ancestors who also have not disappeared. Their delicate songs I wear on my eyelids. Their smiles have given me freedom, which is a crater I keep falling in. When I bite into the two halves of an orange whose cross section resembles my lungs, a delta of juices bursts down my chin and like magic makes me appear to those who think I've disappeared. Okay, let's pause there for a yes. second. I'm gonna have you continue. That's a great, you know, he doesn't give us, he doesn't give us obvious breaks. He puts his periods between the lines, which makes it hard to define. But I love that because here too, what I think what Jackson is doing quite deliberately is kind of mixing things up almost again, like a jazz rhythm, which is not typical and keeps us off balance as we're reading the poem. I love this metaphor. I love the metaphor of when I bite. And so now, has become very physical. He tells yeah. us he's got tattoos. He talks about how our ancestors have not disappeared. Why? Because just like the motes of dust I create continue my existence, their delicate song I wear on my eyelids. It is such a physical idea. Their smiles have given me freedom, which is a crater I keep falling in. So it's almost as though as much as it, it's it, for me when i read that line i don't know how it feels for you but when i read that line i feel that free, freedom the crater i keep falling in is like despite myself despite the challenges i fall into the cre a crater they made 
because they still exist. It's like, it's hard to jump over a crater. You can jump over a hole in the ground, but a crater is pretty big. And it's not a bad thing necessarily that he's falling into this crater. It's kind of like they've laid this out for him. And then that incredibly rich metaphor. This is where um, Major Jackson, you know, where we have all of our senses engaged in this poem. This is where we can taste and smell the poem. When you're reading this, did you not did you not taste and smell an orange? <laughs> yes. You almost can't help it. You can't help it. When I bite into the two halves of an orange whose cross section resembles my lung, so there's again that kind of idea of breathing, a delta of juices burst down my chin and like magic makes me appear to those who think I've disappeared. So he, you know, it's so physical. It's like the way a child eats a piece of fruit, right? Where the juices are running down his chin and Major Jackson here is like a little boy again. By the way, if you do get to see him reading this, notice his smile when he reads this part. There is this big smile almost despite himself as he talks about the juices <clears throat> bursting down his chin. So let's continue on because now the tone changes a little bit. He talks about what makes people disappear and it's not good. You want me to? Can... Yes, please. Okay. It's too bad war makes people disappear like chess pieces and that prisons turn prisoners into movie endings. When I fade into the mountains on a forest trail, I still have not disappeared even though its green facade turns my arms and legs into branches of oak. It is then I belong to a southerly wind, which by now you have mistaken as me nodding back and forth like a chassid in prayer or a mother who has just lost her son to gunfire in Detroit. I have not disappeared. Okay, we're going to pause there for a second. There is so much. You notice how he starts off, again, almost, you want to go back to that freedom train. The train starts off slowly. The train kind of lunges its way down the tracks, if you will. Little, little, a couple of feet at a time, built speed. Right here in this stanza, there's so much going on, isn't there? Yeah. Make the comment about war. It's too bad. War makes people disappear. And then that incredible metaphor, it is technically a simile, of course. I'll, I'll think of it as a metaphor, like chess yeah. pieces, almost as though we're just pawns on the chessboard. Like, what a shame to think of people's lives being used in such a trivial way. And then even that line that jumps out, think of all, there's some great movies about prison, you know, Escape from Alcatraz, Charles Shank Redemption. But Nine, um, Major here is telling us that prisons turn prisoners into movie endings, and that it's so much more than that. We just can't end the movie and roll the credits on the lives of prisoners and forget that they exist. And then it gets even more philosophical. He becomes part of nature. Here is where I think Major Jackson is doing a Whitman. He is really putting a Whitmanian idea in play here when he enters into the natural world. Suddenly, his spirit, his life, his presence is now when I fade into the mountains on a forest trail, I still have not disappeared. Even though his green facade turns my arms and legs into branches of oak, it's amazing how he now becomes one with nature. It's a very romantic impulse. It's a very transcendental impulse. Going back to you know our buddy Whitman and Dickinson from the 19th century, it is then I belong to the southerly wind, which by now you have mistaken as me nodding back and forth like a Hasid in prayer or a mother who has just lost her son to gunfire in Detroit. Isn't it incredible how he takes those two very opposite, almost paradoxical images and puts them in one sentence. This is a poet's way of shaking us out of a comfort zone. We don't think of a Hasidic Jew in prayer in the same space as a mother who lost a son to gunfire in Detroit. And yet mm -hmm. he sees them in the same sphere, in the same sentence as that prayer, <coughs> that mother's grief, all belong to the same sense of, are we going to continue appearing or are we going to disappear? And then he adds right afterward, those four <coughs> words again, 
I have not disappeared. Let's bring it home. Let's read it to the end. <clears throat> Who will read next? I, in my chill, if you read before, that's fine. Wow. I, read. I will read if you wish. Yes, please. Okay. In my children, I see my bulging face pressing further into the mysteries. In a library in Tucson, on a plain above, Buenos Aires, on a field whose nearby burns a controlled fire, I am held by a professor, a general, and a photographer. One burns a finely wrapped cigar, then sniffs the scented pages of my books, scouring for the bitter smell of control. I hold him in my mind like a chalice. I'm going to ask you to continue reading, but let's just pause there for just two minutes. <laughs> Notice now how we've gone from being part of nature, and now we've gone from the natural world, which of course we don't create, we inhabit, and we're back into the constructed world, the world what human beings create. We create libraries. We create planes. We have, we make the controlled fire to maybe control a wildfire. And then he talks about himself as part of his book, as part of his poem, you know, the way I would do in class, like say, here's, here's Major Jackson, right? I am held by a professor, a general, and a photographer. It's like they are now, I am now existing in my words, in my poetry, in their hands and through their voice. And then he gets into the one burns a finely wrapped cigar, then sniffs the scented book of my pages. That is one of the reasons, folks, I can never do the ebook. I can never do, I mean, some people can do it. I need the book. I need the smell of the pages. I need the physicality. But yes. as, as, as most of us would agree, I'm on the back nine of my professorial career. So, <laughs> and that's fine. Somebody's got to be there. Somebody's got to be there. Uh, I love looking at my up and coming colleagues in their 30s and in their 40s and where they're going to be taking this conversation next. And I'm very excited. So let's continue on. Scouring for the bitter, I love this, scouring for the bitter smell of control. It's kind of like they want to figure me out. They want to kind of say, this is what, this, and, this, and I'm, frankly, I'm doing it right now. I'm doing what he's talking about in the poem. I'm saying, this is how we look at Major Jackson. And that's that bitter smell of control. I hold him in my mind like a chalice. I have not disappeared. So now let's take it to the very end. I have Father, not. Oh. Go ahead. Anybody, go friend? ahead. Is that friend yeah. Read? yeah, anybody, anybody at all. All right, I'll go. I swish the amber hue of lager on my tongue and ponder the drilling rigs in the Gulf of Alaska and all the oil painted plovers. When we talk about limits, we disappear. In Jasper, Texas, you can disappear on a strip of gravel. Wow. I am a life in sacred language. Termites toil over a grave and my mind is a ravine of yesterdays. At a glance, from across the room, I wear September on my face, which is eternal and does not disappear, even if you close your eyes once and for all, simultaneously, like two coffins. It is just remarkable. If that ending doesn't take your breath away, my God. You know, when do we disappear? The only time we disappear okay. is when we let ourselves talk about limits, right? Oh. In this poem, if you go back and read it from beginning to end, the poet has made it clear he is limitless, which is why he will never disappear. He is part of this, he is now part of the southerly wind. He's part of the mountains. He's part, he's falling into the crater of his ancestors who have made that crater before him. He can't help it. Um, he talks about, again, almost like the freedom train talking about Birmingham in Jasper, Texas. You can disappear on a strip of gravel. But where he brings it back, I, this is who I am. This is how he defines himself ultimately. I am a life in sacred language. I am another voice. And my voice, my echo will persist. And then he brings us kind of almost like a, a, a very finite ending here. But I don't think of the finite as sad. 
I don't think of the finite as death because I think one of the reasons he chooses September because September is where summer ends and fall begins. And it's part of the natural season of life. And so I think he brings us down into September to remind us that everything will have in its physical existence a beginning, a middle, and an end. Amen. Very Aristotelian, right? Aristotle taught us that. Every good piece of writing has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And then, oh, then was born the five paragraph essay, which we've gotten away from. Oh, there's a train. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can't make it up folks termites toil over a grave and my i love this my mind is a ravine of yesterdays in that one phrase he captures everything about memory right yesterdays yesterdays play in our heads at a glance from across the room i wear september on my face which is eternal you know and does not disappear even if you close your eyes once and for all simultaneously like two coffins. So it's like he reminds us that even after we close our eyes, even when our physical existence ends, physical existence ends, we can stay, we will exist. And the proof of that is the fact that we're still reading Whitman. We're still reading Langston Hughes. We're still reading County Cullen. We're still reading Frederick Douglass. We're still hearing about Harriet Tubman. We're still reading Homer and the Odyssey. They show up all the time. Shakespeare famously predicted in one of his end sonnets, right? Um, I think uh, sonnet 116, uh, if this be error and upon me proved, I never written or no man ever loved. Like my song, my, my words will continue on 400 plus years after I'm physically in my grave. Um, and we're going to still be talking about it. So we have time for one more. I love this Clifton Lucille poem because it fits in so beautifully with where we are. This is a great ender to our poem. This uh, to our poetry discussion today, I think. That's why I put it here. Also, it's short. So I'm gonna have just one person. Also, I want you to notice a couple things about this poem. Lucille Clifton deliberately throughout the poem and in the title does not capitalize. Right. You know who made that famous? E.E. E. Cummings. E.E. Yeah. Right. E. Cummings really did not like capitalization. He does on occasion, but he stays away from it. And he's, he hates punctuation. Oh my God. <laughs> Get rid of these signs. Like, you know what I'm talking about. We don't need this apostrophe. We don't need this comma. Move on. And it creates words. But this is, I think, this is a great question for all of us today. On Juneteenth, as we are saying goodbye to spring, as strange as it's been, and we're welcoming summer tomorrow. By the way, for those of you playing at home, summer officially begins. The summer solstice here in this time zone is 5.44 p.m. So at 5.44 p.m. tomorrow, you know, just kind of like welcome summer. Our first full day will be Father's Day for the longest day of the year. So I think Lucille Clifton, and again, I invite you to look her up reading this. She is saying, celebrate with me. Celebrate with me because guess what? Everything... All these things that try to kill me every day, either physically or metaphorically, have failed. And so I'm going to have somebody just take us home and read it from top to bottom, and we'll talk about it. And I'm happy to go to any questions about anything we talked about today. I, I, I'll read this one. Please. Thank you. You won't celebrate with me. Won't you celebrate with me what I have... I have shaped into a kind of life. I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up. Here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight, my other hand, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. That is awesome. Wow. That is so awesome. That is so powerful because Lucille doesn't just put, you know, a happy face on everything and I'm still here and it's all okay. She's reminding us that you know, as a, and, and I love the way she doesn't say as a black woman or a person of color and woman, she does it in the negative, both non-white and woman. I mean, she could have easily said both one non-white and non-male. 
but she says at non-white. So it's kind of like I have this, I have this double challenge here. Um, but I love the way she talks about how she had no model, right? Like born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be? What did I imagine myself to be except myself? And in so many ways, yes, we have history, we have parents, we have upbringing, we have teachers, but in so many ways, what we do with that is what we become. I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay. You notice what she does there? That simple phrase, that metaphor of the bridge between starshine and clay, if you, I'm sure we've all heard by now that no matter how you slice it, we are all stardust. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the stuff at the beginning of time is the stuff we've got and you can't make any more and you can't destroy it. And we are literally stardust. Ask any scientist. It'll tell you the same thing. So between starshine and clay, in that one phrase, she does something great poets know how to do. She puts together the story of creation from the Bible where God formed the human being out of clay, man out of clay and breathed life in. And she bookends it with the Big Bang, the other side of evolution, the other side of creation. And neither one of them are competing with each other. It's like, yes and yes. I am, I am dust and to dust I shall return. And yet, hey, you know what? I'm also starship. It reminds me of something, I, I do a uh, thing in my classes sometime, and I'm mindful of the time here. Uh, some of you may know this fella. He's pretty famous. He does a lot of work in New York City, and he does a lot of work with, with dialogue, with interfaith religion. His name is Rabbi, Rabbi Burton Vysotsky. And one time, Vysotsky was giving a talk about how, uh, for people, especially of the Jewish faith, there's two lines. I may not quote this exactly, so please forgive me. It's not an exact quote. He says that in, in the study of Torah, in the study of the scriptures, the human, the human mind, the human being, is constantly between these two opposite polar views. On one hand, I am nothing but dust and to dust I shall return. And on the other side, also in the scripture, it is for me the universe was created. And somehow we position ourselves between those two incredibly disparate views. And here I think Lucille is latching onto that somehow in her own way, on this bridge between starshine and clay. And notice here, it's not my one hand holding tight to yours or my one hand holding tight. What is she doing? My Your one hand, hand holding tight, my other hand. It's like, I've all, I'm all I got. Right. This mm -hmm. is who I am. I have, to, I have to depend on me. And so come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me. Something has tried to dispirit me. Something has tried to take away. And very often, we're not always talking about physical death. I mean, we've seen recently physical death is final and it's very real. But I remember one time hearing the talk and a priest friend of mine had said, um, many people die at 30 and they die at 40, but we don't bury them until they're 75 or 80. Oh, I think you get it, right? Yeah, that was a, We yeah. know exactly what that means. That yeah. spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, the person has stopped growing and yet their bodies continue on. And I think Lucille Clifton here is reminding us that something will always be there to not just try to kill you physically, will try to kill your intellectual curiosity, will try to kill your spirit, will try to kill your optimism, will try to kill your belief that the freedom train will be the real deal. But she's saying, let that thing fail. Let that thing fail because you can keep holding on to your other hand and make it work. So we are almost exactly at two o'clock and I would love to hear any comments, 
any questions. Yeah, the, the horn just went off. So, <laughs> but, but it has, I just, I'll just say for me, and I want to hear what you have to say. I have so thoroughly enjoyed these couple of weeks caring about where we are and, and, and how the poetry really gives us like an intellectual, emotional, and spiritual sustenance at this time, especially. We can draw off these great poets who have vision, two of whom, as I said today, are still with us and writing. So I, I really thank you for this opportunity because it's bright in my day as we go from spring to summer. So let's hear from all of you. Thank you. Thank you. This was so Sandy. Hello. Hello. Hi, Sandy. I just wanted to thank you very, very much again for your discussion part two, and I wish you a good weekend, and I want to thank everyone. Thank well, you, Sam. I, I appreciate Sandy. it. No. It was just great. Thank you so yeah. much. You're welcome. Happy, happy Father's Day. I yes. just want to say how poetry was so helpful in this moment that we're all living through. Oh, God, yes. yes. Just... I hope that there will be more. There, 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 I promise there, as long as I'm around, there will be more poems. And even when I'm not, there'll be more poems. So, uh, you know, you're not got, disappearing. I know, no, oh, not, I'm, not, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not, not going anywhere. Uh, Can I, and it's, yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. It's Shirley. Just Hi, before, Shirley. <laughs> just before you came on, I was listening uh, to Andrea Mitchell and LeVar Burton was on. Yes. And he uh, was talking about Juneteenth, that if you go to Google Doodle with LeVar Burton, there's some wonderful readings for today. So I thought I'd like to share that with you. Oh, thank you so much. I, I'm going to share this with a bunch of friends and colleagues right now. I love LeVar Burton. My God, you know. I oh, really yeah. Love the rainbow. LeVar Burton as, yes. uh, as in Ruth, <laughs> oh, Ruth and Yes, yes. From the seventies, yes. and then he went on to the Star Trek and everything. Sure, so sure. He had, he's not disappearing. He's no, not disappearing. No, no. <laughs> not at all. Thank you, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Sam. That's great. You're and welcome. who else? Anybody else like to share a yes. comment? Don. Yes. When when we were reading Langston Hughes' poem, the the line about uh, freedom isn't freedom if a man ain't free. For some reason, that reminded me of the Janis Joplin. Freedom don't mean oh, right. Freedom doesn't freedom, don't mean nothing freedom, just me. another word, right? Yeah. For saying nothing, nothing left, left to lose. lose. Yeah. I know. I know. Yeah, that's how and you know when you're on. Just yeah, yeah, I know. But, you know, that it's interesting. That is a really cool connection between Janis Joplin, who had her own, you know, issues and things. I mean, we're pretty well documented. Um, but that's a powerful line in terms of Langs understanding Langston Hughes. Mean, because yeah. when we reach that place where you have nothing left to lose, then in some respects, you really are free. Um, you really are free because you're like, okay, well, you know, we got to make it happen this time because we can't lose any more than we already have. So let's take a chance. Sometimes, sometimes we limit ourselves and we disappear or, or we, we box ourselves in because we're afraid to lose something or we're afraid we're not going to get something we want. And once we can free ourselves of that, then we really are free. Then we right, can be part right. of that. Then we're part of that southerly wind. And, uh, you know, and the thing that woke up today trying to kill me will fail. <laughs> <laughs> Could I say Thank something? so much. Yes, I'm yes Bernard. I, uh, okay. <laughs> He's next to me. Um, I was reading the Times Arts section this morning and an article about a couple of old uh, TV shows which have the Juneteenth on it, and it's a black woman, um, Maya Phillips writing, and her article ends with Lucille Clifton and your poem. Wow, and wow, said, and that's in the Times art section today? Yes, on page uh, C3. And honest to God, folks, I did not get to my Times art section today yet. It's been a busy morning. And these poems were picked last week. Yeah. So some I things, you know, was. the universe just kind of reminds yes. us that we're, we've got to, we, there's something going on here. Whatever, 
one spiritual position are. There's there's synergy. There's, thank you so much for sharing that. I love I love when those connections just happen. You know, yeah, that is great. And I love Maya. Maya is a brilliant brilliant um, part of the New York Times. I you know one of the things I love about this group is that I know even though I can't see you all, I can see this at the library. Everybody in this group is like so on top of everything. You're all reading your New Yorkers and your New York Times and you're on top of the broadcast and you know what's going on with Google Doc and, and LeVar Burton. I mean, that just, I wish my students were more like you folks, okay? Because I, I, I wish they did one tenth of what you guys do every day. So God bless it, man. Keep it, that's how we keep these conversations going. Give them we a few decades. We die at 45, we're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was that priest from Seton Hall who said that. Oh, really? He did come one time for me, you know, one of the sessions. I don't know if anybody remembers. But he's a, he's a priest at Seton Hall and he came, Father, I can't remember his name, but he did quote that part about um, people be dying at 35 or 45, but we don't bury them. At yeah, but we don't bury them for 40 years and that's, <laughs> that's the problem. And, you know, we all have to just kind of wake up yeah. in the morning and always check our, our, what I sometimes call my, you know, my, um, oh. what's the term, my, my, uh, my emotional barometer. Okay. You know, make sure my emotional barometer, because it's very easy to look at the world, however we get our information, whatever medium you use, it's very easy. The easy thing is to get frustrated, to get angry, yeah. and to get pessimistic. That's the natural course of things. But I think what makes the human being special is that we have the capacity to make a different choice. Right. And we can look at these poets, all of whom are parents of people of color, who have all experienced in their own way some really horrible things. Um, and they're telling us to keep on it, to stay with it, and to be hopeful. And so if they can do it, we can do it. We can do it. So Joni Mitchell uses that stardust imagery. Yes, she oh. does. Oh, we, yeah. We are stardust, we are golden, and we've got to get back to the garden. Yes, yes, yes. So there it is again, right? Stardust and garden all in the same, same sphere together, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That is awesome. So again, you folks, have, you make you make connections with this stuff that I wish my poetry classes could do more often. <laughs> Thank you for that, Winifred. I know you're not Winifred, but I, I'm just losing the names. I'm seeing the little faces and the little boxes. Uh, welcome to the 21st century, folks. But at the same time, as much as I have my, you know, my concerns and my issues with technology, this is the good part of it. This is the technology that I like because it enables us to do this. Right. It gives us the medium right. to keep these oh, conversations yeah. going. We need it. We need it. It is our, this is, this is the daily bread for the mind and the heart and the spirit. That's right. Yeah. All right. Good. Good. All right, folks. So, uh, okay. I'm looking you know, I'll jump time. in here. This is Please. Melissa. Cause I want to thank you, John, since Phyllis Thanks. isn't here to do it. And, Thank you very, very much. And you know, you guys, we've started, you can request books and do pick up at the library. So if you want to keep reading, if you're interested in poetry, you can call us and let us know what it is you want to want to check out. So um, we're happy to do that. But John, that was brilliant that you did two weeks in a row and both uh, my were pleasure. wonderful today, my especially. So. Uh, I, when I, I say this from my heart, and those of you who've seen me before know I mean it. When I'm with you guys, there's no place else I'd rather be. There's no place else I'd rather be for this hour because you leave me better than you found me. I mean, you really raise my spirit. I'm going to leave you with one thought. If you got, for those of you who have pen and paper handy, check this out sometime. I came, I used a poem on my daily poem thread about Gandhi called The Mysteries of God. It's a really cool poem written by Gandhi about any conception of God you have. But while looking for that poem, I read, most of you know the actor Anthony Hopkins, right? Very yeah, famous yeah, actor. Yeah. You know, he's Hannibal Lecter. Oh, who will ever, oh, he was the best Hannibal Lecter ever. You couldn't bet who he was. But look up something called, seven, it's a seven minute clip, but Anthony Hopkins on his theory of life. I don't know how else to put it. It's like it's a life theory, life ethos. 
he is not necessarily he could he calls himself an agnostic which is fine but he will tell you what has driven him since boyhood to do the things he's done that is so amazing and beautiful and inspiring and i'll share one little thing he mentions over the seven minutes he says at some point in his career, when he was becoming successful, and he was like having those down moments where he's thinking, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing it right? Am I doing what I want to do? He went back and he found a picture of himself as a little boy. I recommend everybody do this. Find a picture of yourself as a child and put it in your wallet or put it on your phone. And as part of your daily morning or your meditation or whatever the heck you do in the morning, Look at the picture of yourself as a kid and look at that picture and say, you did all right, kid. Yeah. <laughs> Your whole mind will open up. Your whole mind will open up. I got that from Anthony Hopkins this past week. It took me 57 years, but I found something new to add to my daily routine. I went back and I got my college, my freshman college photo because that is a picture where I had no idea what's going on. <laughs> and I look at that picture and my girlfriend said, you look pretty confident in that picture. I said, that is a mask. <laughs> I said, that is all BS. I said, I had no idea what's going on in 1981 and I was terrified. So I look at that picture now and I say, you know what? Nobody's perfect. We're not gonna have all the answers. We did it right. We're doing, we're doing okay. Let's keep that thought in mind. So I want to wish you all the best. Happy summer. Um, whatever your background is, God bless you all. Stay healthy. Take care of yourselves. And, you know, every day, get a good hug from somebody you're allowed to hug in your house. And tell somebody, anybody, if you, even if you told them it before, tell them you love them. And it just feels so good. And laugh. Find something good to laugh at. You got to have a good laugh every day. That is, more, that is more You're important bad. than water. <laughs> Good laugh. <laughs> Thank Good you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. 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 Th